Today, we'll hear from Graham Gardner, author of Tiny and Wild, Build a Small Scale Meadow Anywhere. He is experienced in landscape design in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. He places value in creating unique spaces inspired by nearby natural plant communities and is a leader in the new paradigm of high functioning, water smart, and low maintenance landscapes. Please welcome Graham Gardner. Thank you, Emma. Give me a moment to share my screen. Okay, welcome. I am Graham Gardner, author of Tiny and Wild, How to Build a Small Scale Meadow Anywhere. And I'm excited to be here with you today. I wanna to start by thanking Emma Emma and the team at Green America for inviting me to share with you a bit about one of my passions, creating biodiverse mini meadows for wildlife and humans alike. I really enjoyed the first segment of Transforming Lawns, Ground Cover Revolution with Kathy Jentz from Washington Gardener Magazine and Garden DC podcast. I appreciated the way that Kathy covered the challenges and benefits that ground covers can address. They overlap nicely with the challenges and benefits of meadows. So if you missed that episode, I recommend watching it when you have a chance. As Tiny and Wild came out in March, I'm fairly new to presentations, so I'm going to be referring to my notes to be sure we get through everything. We have a lot to cover. Let's get started. So you've heard the calling for a more resilient, biodiverse landscape full of flowers and movement that's inspired by natural plant communities and the wild spaces around you. Have you ever arrived at the crest of a hill and discovered a field of vibrant wildflowers awaiting you on the other side? Do you recall the sense of joy and awe these moments of discovery provided? Today, we will start to learn how to capture that essence and transport it to your home. In this session, I'll introduce you to the concept of mini meadows and why they are important. We will cover where to find inspiration to make yours unique to your area. We'll briefly discuss how to select your site along with some location ideas. And I'll show you a few aspirational case studies of beautiful designs. Then we'll get into some basic design considerations to get your imagination going including the important role maintenance plays in the success of your project. Many people think of meadows as large open wild spaces or acres of agricultural land. Here we will distill those vast landscapes into plant collections that fit your site. Squint your eyes and transpose that texture, energy and seasonality into a tiny corner or an entire lot. Did you know that driving, excuse me, did you know that one hour of lawn mowing generates the same pollution as driving 300 miles in a car? Lawns are the number one irrigated crop in the United States. Creating a mini meadow offers you a chance to rethink the amount of your property devoted to lawn. The interest in naturalistic planting design is part of a greater movement toward ecological landscape management. Regardless of the size of your property, you make choices that will affect the local environment. As you become more informed about an ecological approach to landscaping and why it's important, you'll have an opportunity to share this knowledge, inspiring friends and neighbors to think differently. As each of your connections create their own mini meadows, a patchwork of more biodiverse habitat will result. Use natural plant communities and existing public gardens to spark your creativity. Here on the left is purple elephant's head, weaving through a wet meadow beside a mountain lake. On the right, 
lemon bee balm, and various seed heads punctuate this grassy street planting design on a challenging urban site. We've heard the phrase a sense of place, but what does it mean to you? Perhaps it's my background, but for me, this often starts with local plants. When I go for a walk in a wild space, what flowers do I observe? What do the plant communities look like? What are the colors of the rocks and soil? What are the predominant shades of the leaves? Is it lush or sparse? Locale is a critical element in design. It's what makes a place unique and gives it its identity. If you build it, they will come. Planting for wildlife can be as focused or as general as you make it. It can be the primary reason for a new meadow or an added bonus. Many insects, around 90%, according to entomologist Doug Talame, are specialists that require specific species with which they've evolved for parts of their life cycles like the center photo of a monarch caterpillar on butterfly milkweed. In addition to inspiration from wild spaces, it's important to have designed landscapes for reference. Here are a few of my favorite mini meadow gardens. On the coast in Massachusetts, on the roof in Chicago, or on the sidewalk in Portland, Oregon. These gardens demonstrate what's possible. While the designers are celebrated professionals, their process includes the same basic steps that you will take. Let's start with site selection. Take an inventory of the existing elements and site conditions in your landscape. Existing elements include items such as walkways, outbuildings, retaining walls, fences, existing plants, and other site features. Site conditions include the sun and shade exposure, moist and dry areas, and the soil type and pH. Once you've taken a closer look at these items, you will then interpret and analyze them to better understand any limitations and opportunities to guide your design plant selection. First, walk your property to identify the high use circulation routes. Then, consider borrowed views from your neighbor's property, such as a beautiful old tree with an attractive form. Take advantage of what's already there. Go to the windows that you look often. Also, go to the windows that you look out most often. What views do they frame? Instead of lawn, envision gazing out at a colorful meadow, teeming with life. Experiment at a scale that feels comfortable to you. This makes it easier to correct your mistakes and expand upon your successes. There are so many potential locations for your mini meadow. Start small and keep it simple. Create a base plan by measuring the square footage of this project space and roughly map it out on paper. As plants and meadows are tightly spaced, there can be 20 to 30 species in one square yard of native meadow. I generally plan for one plant per square foot. This allows for adjustment in the field. Some, such as taller grasses, may be placed one and a half to two feet on center. Smaller ground cover species may be placed nine inches or even six inches apart. One plant per square foot is a rough approximation and will depend on the size of your project and the species that you plan to include. Use the number of plants you will need to guide you as you create your plant list. 
collect images for inspiration. Start a list of your own and then narrow it down. Keeping it simple means planning for multiples and repetition. Choose plants suited for the site. I cannot emphasize this enough. Use your site assessment to guide you. You will have more success selecting plants that thrive in your growing conditions than trying to amend your site to fit the needs of certain plants. Don't worry about the specifics on this list. It's an example of one of the lists in the back of my book. There's a whole chapter devoted to the topic with some of my favorite species for different applications. For today, I just wanna to touch upon some basic ideas. Plant lists can be customized to include the information relevant to you and your project. Start with the Latin names. I know this may seem daunting, but this is the best way to ensure that you are referring to the correct species. Other categories to consider are quantity, height, width, the type, for example, bulb, grass, perennial, ground cover. Include the bloom time to ensure continuous flowering over the seasons and color as well. You may wish to include categories for budgeting, such as the price per plant. I always leave a notes column at the end, which acts as a catch-all for tidbits of info that don't necessarily require their own category, such as maintenance tips, or which butterflies and beneficial insects a species hosts or attracts. As we discussed in the site assessment slide, Circulation is key. How will you access your meta? Will you include a path? Pathways lead the eye through a garden, as well as offer a way to move through a planting and experience it from within. Depending on the scale of your mini meadow, keep in mind access for maintenance so that you don't compact the soil or trample the plants. Here are some essential design elements to consider, starting with color. And forgive me, when I practiced this, I was speaking much faster and I'm trying to slow down. Um, so I'm gonna skip around a little bit to make sure that we get through everything. In many ways, color is a personal preference. However, there are certain combinations that read more successfully. Some people have an innate sense of color harmony or visual pleasing color combinations. If you don't fit that category, consult a color wheel. Often I'll start with selecting either warm tones, red, orange, and yellow, or cool tones, green, blue, and purple, as the overarching color theme. If most of the flowers will be cool, I may select a couple of species that contrast with the predominant pool color. Here, the color palette will be harmonious because I have selected analogous colors that have added a bit of drama and have added a bit of drama with a contrasting pop provided by one or two warm colored plants. Remember, color is not just about flowers either. There's a whole spectrum of green. The foliage of plants is also an important component as it exists even when the plants are not in bloom. Layering is how the plants are arranged on the vertical plane. The specific layers, or excuse me, the simplified layers of a meadow planting include the tall structural species, the medium fill plants, and the lower ground cover plants. Layering is important for several reasons. First, layering creates complex visual interest. Not only is there the static image of how a plant looks today or a planting looks today, but also the dynamic temporal layering of how plants emerge, fill in, and wither over time. 
Secondly, dense layering will reduce your maintenance by shading out weed species. The less open ground available for seeds to germinate, the less weed chores, weeding chores you will encounter. Third, layering offers diverse habitat, shelter, and forage to wildlife, attracting more species to your garden. While there is no perfect formula, I target for a ratio of one quarter tall structural species, one half mid-height plants, and one quarter ground cover species. In the tallest layer where certain plants emerge above the rest, it's important to keep architecture in mind. You want to keep the focus on strong silhouettes. With the mid layer, within the mid layer are seasonal drifts, architectural plants, and intermixed species or matrix plants. Keep skipping through. Generally, perennials do not flower for long periods. It's important to identify those species that you'd like to include just for their seasonal blooms. So you place them accordingly, typically in mass. Architecture plants are those with distinctive structures that help them stand out from the others in and out of flower. Intermixed or matrix layer plants are species that play well in mixed fruits. Instead of blocks or drifts of single species, these are drifts of various species that are repeated. Finally, there's the ground cover layer that Kathy provided so many details about and options for last month. This can be made up of low spreading plants and short clumping plants. Due to their small size, group low clumping species together so that they will read well. When considering texture, I often think of foliage, from fine and narrow to fat and strappy. Be sure to select a variety of textures so that there is a balance. Just as too many bold colors can be chaotic, so too can bold leaf shapes. The opposite is also true. Using too many plants with delicate foliage can look messy or lack interest. Balance occurs when large leaves punctuate the finer textured foliage. Gardens are ever changing throughout the seasons, over the course of years, and even throughout the day. For wildlife and visual interest alike, it's important to understand how your meadow will change over the seasons, as well as from year to year. This is the same planting about three months apart. I'm gonna skip through this one quickly. Um, the importance here is just to consider how long the plants will persist. So whether they're an annual, biennial or perennial, and learn to intermix them so that you can achieve the longest bloom time. I often use young perennial plants in my designs, so sold as either plugs or in small pots. Um, young perennials may not bloom in their first or even second year, so I include a percentage of annuals, typically annuals that I know will least seed. As the perennial plants begin to establish, these self-seeding annuals will volunteer in the voids between the more permanent plants. In addition to ensuring that flowers you like will bloom year after year, you also want to aim for a continuity of bloom throughout the seasons. Include a column in your plant list for bloom time. Once planted, keep track of when each species bloom in your garden. If you notice there are periods of time where nothing is blooming, look for a species to fill that gap. Here are some examples of the design concepts we just covered. Have you heard of um, one way to, uh, we just covered that also in the 
talk through, excuse me. Now that you've been introduced to some design basics, you're ready to start imagining how you'll apply them to your space. You can do so either creating a planting plan or a planting strategy. A planting plan can be simple or complex, a rough sketch or a carefully detailed drawing. If you decided to create a base plan, layer trace paper over it and get started. Trace paper allows for you to crumple it up and start again as you work through the process of putting your ideas on paper. The best way to learn is to just begin. You may use bubbles to represent masses of certain species or groups of mixed plantings, different patterns, symbols, shapes, or even colors can represent different plants. The point is to work out your ideas and the relationship each plant or plant mass has to one another. As you will most likely be installing the design yourself, only you need to decide, I mean, excuse me, only you need to understand your drawings. This gives you even more freedom to let loose and work through your design. Another option is to create a planting strategy. Rather than the exact location of each plant, a strategy is more about how you will lay the plants out during installation. Consider how the plants you have selected fit into the various design considerations mentioned earlier, especially the layers component. Sort your plant list by height and group different ranges together, such as emergent, mid, and low ground cover. Use your sorted plant list and understand the basic design concepts and understanding of the basic design concepts. You can then lay your planting out in the field as you install. I will often create a conceptual planting plan and a planting strategy. Then allow additional whimsy and spontaneity to occur during the placement and planting. Another aspect to keep in mind as you create your plant list and begin designing is plant availability. You may have found a certain species on a walk or seen a specific cultivar in a magazine that you would like to include that is not available in your area or in the trade in general. Sourcing adds another filter to your design process. Familiarize yourself with the stock at your local nursery, nurseries. While inventories at big box retailers may change rapidly between visits, smaller local nurseries will often have a consistent list of what they carry. They may even publicize the list ahead of the growing season. Ask questions during your scouting missions. Make friends with the staff. Maybe the nursery would be willing to bring in a certain species for you or point you in a direction of a better source. Mail order is another option for sourcing plants. Typically, they ship bare root, without soil, or in small pots. Sometimes you will not be able to find everything on your list. It's helpful to have alternatives in mind that work as substitutions. One area we have yet to discuss is budget. Costs will vary greatly based on the scope of the project, the area which you plan to purchase material, and your patience. If you want a mature garden right out of the gate, you plan to pay a little more. I encourage clients to design as if a budget doesn't exist, and then value engineer, scale back, or phase the project to fit within their budget. That way your dreams and designs are not immediately limited by cost considerations and you can have more fun. An example would be to plant half of the species in the spring and wait to install the second half in the fall. Also keep in mind the cost savings of growing from seed. Understanding how to select and install plants are key skills when designing a new garden. Tips for growing from seed and other budget hacks will help you plan, design, and schedule your project. In addition to your plant lists and planting plan, 
learn a few layout and installation strategies. Learning a few layout and installation strategies will give you opportunity to refine your design in the field. The design process is fluid and iterative. It can be simple, linear steps forward toward the end goal, or be something more circular, where you are improving upon your approach as you gain a more holistic understanding of all the components. Have fun, relax, and experiment. But remember, proper maintenance is part of the design process and essential to the overall success of your project, especially the first couple of years while your new meadow becomes established. And I'm gonna breeze through these next few slides also just to stay on time. In addition to enjoyment, watering and weeding will be your primary tasks during the first year. However, in order to know what to weed, you'll need to define the term for yourself and begin to learn to identify the plants that appear in your plot. Don't worry, over time you will become familiar with what shows up. While there are advantages to knowing the specific maintenance needs of each species, the real advantage is the ability to treat the entire meadow as a plant system. This simplifies your tasks and takes the pressure off of expecting to keep a perfectly manicured garden. In fact, it is in the untidiness that you invite the wilderness in and permit yourself the freedom to enjoy your creation. If you've planted during the rainy season and mother nature is taking care of this task, lucky you. If you've planted outside of this window or live in a drier climate with less rain, you will need to water intermittently during establishment. You'll want your plants to have the moisture they need to thrive, but you also want them to develop deep roots so they can survive on their own as they do in the wild. The best way to encourage this is to water deeply but infrequently. When you are supplemental watering during plant establishment, eventually you will slowly taper the number of times you water per week. If you've decided to grow plants from seed, you will need to water more frequently to help keep the surface layer damp during germination. Young plants have tiny root systems and are more susceptible to drying out faster than larger plants. Initially, after installing your garden, there will be gaps between the plants. It takes a few seasons for plants to get established. You may also lose some. With a dense meadow planting, I plan for about a 10% loss over the first couple of years. Have you heard the phrase, nature abhors a vacuum? As it applies to gardening, it means that unless the conditions are truly unfavorable, plants will fill in bare ground. Slowly, any bare patch of earth will welcome new plants. Those species that love the growing conditions will begin to spread. I welcome these new volunteer plants as they fill in the open spaces. These unplanned moments further create a spontaneity and whimsy that can be difficult to perfect in a plant space. It's important to learn what plants look like when they are young seedlings. This takes patience and observation. It can be tempting to treat all unidentified plants as weeds. Pay attention to what grows around what you have planted. Start a list of problem species that are undesirable and learn to identify and remove them when they are young. If you are unsure of what something is, let it remain until you know. Volunteer plants are a gift that help you fill in the space by choosing their placement and showing you what performs best in your conditions. Many people grew up with a fear of insects due to limited understanding, myself included. Having a garden for wildlife offers you an opportunity to correct and overcome that misunderstanding. Think of your garden as a learning landscape. Welcome and identify the diversity of visitors. Before you reach for a spray or seek out an all natural pest control, wait. Keep a journal or a list of the various insects that you see. Take notes on which species attract which insects. Learn about the beneficial insects in your area and see if you can spot any in your meadow. 
Remember that insects go through various life stages. So try to familiarize yourself with them so you know what you're observing. observing. That caterpillar munching on your leaves could turn into your favorite butter, a, a favorite butterfly. I generally let the plants and insects work it out themselves. For example, when aphids are present, I will often see ladybug eggs and larvae nearby. If I had reached for the insecticidal soap, I would have risked hurting these beneficials as well. This is an opportunity to watch and learn. When doing any landscape maintenance, always approach the task with the question, who are you managing the garden for? In the past, most garden maintenance prioritized tasks directed towards humans. The aesthetics of the garden was considered through the lens of what was fashionable for people. Now that we're considering design and maintenance from a more ecological perspective, ask yourself, who else am I managing the landscape for? Make your practices most attractive to them. Removing the plant material in the fall reduces places for beneficial insects and other wildlife to overwinter. Winter interest is an important design consideration in climates with four seasons. The texture of architectural plants and the silhouettes of seed heads are particularly striking dusted in snow. If you've never considered winter interest, search online or at the library for in images and examples for inspiration. As we discussed earlier, lists help to store and organize your research. If you, make a, if you make a spreadsheet, you can then sort it based on the categories that you choose, such as height or bloom time. There is no one size fits all approach. Include the information that you will use. Extra effort in creating your plant list will simplify your design and installation process, as well as the ongoing maintenance. A well-researched and organized list will also be useful when creating future designs or when sharing information with friends and neighbors. Find the intersection where beauty and function meet by researching what's right for your site, aesthetic, and local ecosystem. Here's another example of a list from the book. The plants in this chart are a good choice for moderate to dry sun locations in average to lean soils. They are mid-height flowering perennials varying from 18 to 30 inches. Combine them with taller structural plants and lower spreading plants and ground covers. So that's about all the time of all the time we have today. I, I hope you're feeling inspired and your imagination is running wild with ideas of how to convert lawn to meadow. We've covered what the what and why of mini meadows, how to find local inspiration unique to your area and ecosystem, some ideas for site selection, some of the elements to consider as you begin to design, and the important role maintenance plays in the success of your project. In addition to going much deeper into each of these subjects, there's so much more that we could discuss, such as preparing the site, sourcing and selecting plants, planting and maintenance techniques, even ideas on which species to plant. All of this is included in my book, Tiny and Wild. So if you're excited to learn more and get started designing a midi meadow of your own, I suggest you grab a copy. Thanks, Graham. For your time today. Oh, one more. Oh, sure. Sorry. Um, no. Uh, thank you for your time today. Here's here's my email um, and Instagram if you want to connect. Feel free to reach out directly. Remember, gardening is about learning. Mistakes and lessons are part of the process. Take your time with each step and, and keep notes. Make informed choices, but allow yourself the freedom to experiment. Meadows are dynamic living systems. Give your creations time to reveal themselves to you and let nature add her dose of creativity. Most of all, have fun. Best of luck to each of you.
Thank you, Graham. Uh, we had some comments in the chat that were marked on uh, how organized this was and how they feel like they're able to do this now and it's not as daunting as it first seemed. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, so I have a few questions for you here. Okay. Uh, Christine D asks whether there are insect species that can benefit from certain types of grasses, perennials, annuals, and any other plants for meadows. Absolutely. That's, that's one of the, the most attractive parts about this, this style or this approach to gardening um, is the relationship with the insects. And um, I really confirmed a lot of my early um, early attraction to the wild plants in my area when Doug Talame's books came out and started to put the science behind it from an entomologist's point of view. So I recommend um, uh, looking at his books and figuring out um, you know, the plants in your area and which species they host. Um, uh, I think it was 90% of, of insects up to nine, or roughly 90% of insects require specific species of plants that they've evolved with for their existence. So um, it's critical the interrelationship between specific local species and the local insect populations in your area. Oh, Grant, could you repeat that name you just mentioned or the resource you mentioned for where they could learn more about that? I'll type it in the chat. Certainly, it's, it's Douglas Talame. And he's an entomologist from, I believe, Maryland. And he's written, his first book was called Bringing Nature Home. And it's about the importance of native plants in the home landscape. Um, I believe a lot of his research focuses on the East Coast, but uh, future, I mean, recent editions, I believe expand more to have suggestions and lists um, from research beyond just, uh, beyond the East Coast of, of the United States. Thank you. Um, uh, what, you mentioned it earlier in your presentation, but what does drift mean in the context of meadows? So a drift of plants is when you, in, um, part of the design of meadows is to make them look intentional, especially if you're living in an area with an HOA, um, and there's a slow shift from, you know, these manicured lawns and traditional flower borders. So a drift would be the same species laid out in a scattered pattern that connects and inter intertwines with each other. So it, you can have a drift of grasses and then plant other things into that drift. Um, you can have a matrix of grasses where you're using different species, but also creating a drift. But it's a loose shape of multiple plants, usually of the same species or of a, a, a similar palette of species. All right. Kevin L asks, what is the best practice for removing grass in the first place, especially in larger spaces? Uh, and then in general, can you address techniques for converting lawns to prepared soil for planting? Yes. So I do cover that in, in detail in the book. Um, the, there are many different methods for the larger spaces. Um, you may wish to string trim or mow to the lowest possible um, setting and really burn the existing turf um, by that practice of, of scalping it. Uh, um, you may wish to, if for smaller spaces, you may wish to lasagna garden where you're layering cardboard or newsprint and um, topsoil and other green material, compost. I do caution um, amending soils significantly as many prairie and meadow species that we think, the species we think of um, in that, of meadow and prairie species, they actually prefer lean soils so that when you amend with a compost, you may actually be encouraging weed species more than you are benefiting the um, meadow and prairie species that you're selecting. Um, you can use a sod cutter. If you have a very large area, I would, and, and the budget permits, I would recommend 
um, renting a sod cutter from a, from a tool equipment rental place uh, that will make, make your life much easier. Um, or you can use a spade and dig out by hand um, for smaller spaces. And then if you have a, a, a lawn that's already um, in decline or it's already patchy, it is possible to plant directly into it. I think I would, again, start by clipping it to the lowest um, setting on your mower or using a string trimmer and then plugging into that, um, giving a good space around each plant um, so that they can wrestle it out uh, during establishment. Uh, Graham, somebody asked if by meadows you mean native plants. Uh, so maybe we need a maybe we need a definition here. <laughs> sure. Um, so I have over the years kind of been all over the spectrum of uh, what some might call a purist, um, and it really depends on your project and the goals that you set for yourself. Um, what you're trying to support or attract. Um, you know, if you're doing an, a restoration or you're adjacent to a natural area, you may wish to choose species of local ecotype, meaning plants that have been grown or seed that's been sourced from the local populations. That's getting a little technical. Um, the, uh, you, you decide what distance you you, how you want to define native. Native could be native to the US, which you know early on I thought that that worked. There were certain leaders in the native plant movement who produced books that showed plants from all over the US. And, and as I started to work with the Native Plant Society where I was living at the time and I was part of the board, we had to really question if that was appropriate anymore. And we did end up using the political boundaries because there were um, records for which species existed in those states. And then we were able to be more clear about our, our goals and our mission statement. But I think at this point, there are many designers and, and books and successful projects that combine they, they reference the plant communities that are local so that you do get a sense of place and you, and you honor the plants that are nearby, but that maybe that isn't as, stri um, as strict as, and as, as um, something for an, an ecolo uh, ecological restoration project. So maybe you're using cultivars of those plants that are nearby, or maybe you're using plants that look like them, that are more traditional perennial plants, but you're placing them in a way that is more meadow-esque. So lots of grasses, um, tighter spacing, repetition, diversity. I, I think it really depends on, on your goals and, and your, own, um, your own understanding of native and, and that evolves over time. And, and um, I wouldn't want anyone to feel limited, but I would caution everyone um, against using plants known to be invasive in the area. So trying to get a list of invasive plants and avoiding them um, would be important. And then you hear the term novel, novel ecosystem, or if you're planting in an urban area or somewhere where you don't have to worry about plants escaping, you can get a, even looser about that whole approach. And um, I didn't have a rule, like my last, I worked for the parks department in Denver and I really, I, I was trying to bring native plants back into the park system in their ornamental beds, but, and I didn't have a, like a percentage rule per se, but um, I would say like 60 to 75% of the plants were from um, the east side of the Rockies and, and then others were maybe not even from the United States, but I knew that they weren't, they had never been considered invasive in the area. So there's, you can have a little fun with it. It's again, it's, it's a personal choice, I would say. I hope that answered the question about Meadow. Sorry, I rambled a little. Oh, that's all right. 
Uh, Rebecca M. wonders whether you can plant wildflowers directly into grass and whether they'll just take over eventually. It depends. I would say it depends on the turf species that you have. There are some more aggressive turf species that like a Bermuda grass, I, I would say you need to eliminate the more aggressive um, stoloniferous colonial species of, of turf grass before planting. Um, and then it also depends on which species you're introducing. So if they're um, uh, a more robust species, then they may be able to, to um, outcompete the grasses over time. So if you have a weak lawn, it's, it's already thin, it's patchy. I think you can experiment and play with it um, and let the lawn species slowly be shaded out over time. Uh, again, it depends on the aesthetic that you're looking for. Um, sometimes it's better to start with a clean canvas, but one thing I didn't mention in the talk was to disturb the soil as little as possible because there's a seed bank in the soil and you're making your job harder the more you're turning it. So avoid rototilling, avoid deep um, shovel turning. And then once the planting goes in, you wanna be weeding plants when they're young. And then if, they're, if the weeds are getting too large, you wanna clip them instead of pulling them out and disturbing the soil over and over again. So it's just gonna make more weed species appear. Thank you. Uh, Holly C asks if you could address how to avoid aphids, especially on milkweed. Haha. Uh -huh. Well, I believe they're oleander aphids um, are the orange ones that we typically see. And honestly, unless it's a really young milkweed, I I, I have learned to take a step back. Um, if it's if it's a quite young species and and it's really being decimated by the by the aphids, you may um, squish them by hand. I've heard that. I'm not sure if that's true that the smushed aphids actually deter future aphids. You can use a hard stream of water. You can consider insecticidal soap. However, like I showed in that photograph with the um, let's see here. So here, these are the oleander aphids, and here are ladybugs already on the milkweed. So if I'm if I'm grabbing the spray, I'm I'm disrupting that ecosystem um, that we're trying to create by gardening in this way. So I I take a step back, and 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 I also know that some plants won't do well, and that just shows me that I might need to select something different. Um, to to replace it with in time so it's about learning what what works and over time the beneficial insects will build up populations in your landscape as you change your practices and have more diversity of plants for them so be patient and observe great advice rose k asks if putting weed fabric two inches down will keep propagating seeds from spreading so I discourage weed fabric um, really anywhere because over time, especially as someone who's been in horticulture and gardening for over 25 years, it ends up failing. I would say, I mean, it, maybe not 100% of the time, but pretty close. And so you're either pulling weeds out that have grown through it, or you're pulling weeds out that have grown on top of it or you're pulling landscape fabric out that's begun to break down over time, I would say avoid it entirely and be more deliberate with your maintenance practices. Um, try not to disturb the seed bank in the soil um, and begin to identify plants when they're young so that perhaps some of the plants that you're pulling out are, are young plants that would work really well amongst your new meadow planting. And, so, so redefine what you think is a weed, I would say. And yes, avoid landscape fabric. All right. Beth B asks if you can recommend plants that help to repel mosquitoes, gnats, and other bothersome insects. I have heard that um, scented aromatic plants are, are good for that. Um, 
there is a section in the back of the book for edible plants that does include more aromatic species as a potential list of subspecies for a meadow. Um, I, I'm not sure. I would say you're better off using these aromatic plants to create some sort of um, all natural spray for yourself and applying it directly than thinking that by planting scented geranium, you know, the, the citronella scented geranium that we see sold everywhere is, is going to work to really deter mosquitoes from your whole property. I think um, that's what I tend to do is, is I use all natural bug spray and apply it to myself. Um, and it would be fun to, to actually be growing the species that you're creating the, the repellent from. So lemongrass and um, scented geranium and lavender and, all, and any of the stronger aromatic plants uh, will, will deter the, the pests, the biting pests. Um, I'm paraphrasing a question here, but does your meadow ever reach a point where you really don't need to maintain it, that it may, where it maintains itself? Never 100%, I would say. Um, even if you're not mowing every year or cutting it back every year, um, in order to maintain the diversity, meadows need a, a little bit of disturbance and, and not necessarily disturbance to the soil as I've cautioned against, but um, cutting back the organic material and removing it and putting it in the compost periodically um, is probably the one task that I would say will benefit from a design of benefit a designed meadow. So a uh, late winter, early spring, if you've incorporated spring bulbs, you want to do it in late winter. Another advantage to late winter is that the ground is frozen so that when you're walking through your meadow, cutting things back, you're not compacting the soil. Um, and then you want to scout for invasive plants or plants that are aggressive and that are throwing off the, the aesthetic that you had, in, had intended. So um, I, I still to this day find, even with all the research and knowledge and, and experience I have, there's always one or two species that I include that begin to get too robust and will need to be culled in some way, either eliminated completely if, if they're behaving differently than I expected, or um, you know, occasionally thinned out. And again, um, part of the fun, I think, is inspiring others. So there's a potential as plants get older to divide them and share them with neighbors and friends or to collect seed from the plants to share with others. So it, you don't have to be um, grooming the plants in the same way that you would a traditional meadow, but there, there will always be an element of, of maintenance, I, I think. Thank you, Graham. Thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure, thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, thank you all for joining again the recording will be sent out in an email likely tomorrow. And uh, all of our gardening webinars are on Green America's YouTube channel as well. Thank you so much, everyone.